North of the Paw, Manitoba is still pretty much Indian country. Dense bush, lonely lakes, not even a road. But 200 miles from the nearest settlement on South Indian Lake, latitude 57 north, temperature 40 below, business is booming. Commercial fishing on a big scale has moved in. The method is simple but effective. Chopping a hole, the fishermen string a 300-foot gill net using an ingenious jigger that claws its way along under the surface of the ice to a second hole. After a day or two, they open the holes again and haul in the net. And in these teeming, unfished lakes, the big ones come in like fruit on a vine. Fishing this way is no job for a tenderfoot, not at 40 below. The fish are frozen as soon as they hit the air. So is the net, and for that matter, the fisherman, if he isn't careful. Up here, most of the men are Indians working in teams of two or three. Running six nets, a team may earn as much as $600 a week. Main catch is whitefish, pickerel, and lake trout. Most people think of Manitoba as an inland wheat province. Yet Manitoba's freshwater fisheries are second only to Ontario's, yielding an annual catch of more than 30 million pounds, worth $5 million. Nearly 90% of this production is sold in the United States, and three-fifths of it is caught in winter. A big operator like Tom Lamb of the Paw sets up a loading dock wherever the fishing looks good, buys the catch on the spot, ships it out by tractor train. Sometimes the choice specimens are flown out unfrozen, but the big volume is hauled by the fish swings. It's a week of day and night slugging to railhead, but from there, it's only a step to the tables of Chicago, Detroit, and New York. Medicine men to 5,000 Indians scattered in small bands through the wild bush and lake country surrounding Norway House in central Manitoba is Dr. Cameron Corrigan, typical of the hardy medicos assigned by Indian Health Services to watch over the welfare of Canada's 136,000 treaty Indians and Eskimos, Dr. Corrigan may, and often does, travel 200 miles to visit a patient. In settlements like God's Lake, Cross Lake, Grand Rapids, or Pukatawagan, the doctor is a familiar and respected figure, friend of everybody. Indians are extremely susceptible to white man's diseases. A simple childhood malady can bring disaster to a whole village. The doctor makes regular inspection tours to check such epidemics before they can begin. Since the establishment of medical service at Norway House in the early 1920s, the doctor has carried on a steady program of immunization against smallpox, diphtheria, whooping cough and the rest, fought tuberculosis and typhoid fever. And many an old one alive today can testify to the success of that program. The doctor and the Indian agent are the principal representatives of the Dominion government to its wards, the Treaty Indians. In his capacity as guardian, the doctor concerns himself with sanitation and nutrition, often includes a few housekeeping tips or a little personal advice as well. And naturally, he knows and watches over every baby in his territory. The best way to keep him well is to catch him young. A youngster who looks perfectly healthy may show symptoms to the doctor's trained eye that bear watching. Off he goes to the hospital for observation. It isn't always as easy as this. During spring breakup, for example, aircraft can't fly. Dr. Corrigan will never forget the time he discovered diphtheria at Cross Lake. He paddled all day through ice-filled water, waded all night through hip-deep muskeg, took 27 hours reaching the railroad to order antitoxin. Then he had to retrace his steps. It took 66 hours of man-killing travel, but he saved every child in the village but one. In winter or summer, with a plane available, things are better. Dr. Corrigan can have a patient in his efficient little 25-bed hospital at Norway House in a few hours. 
The Canadian government operates 18 such hospitals for Indians with a total capacity of 1,300 beds. There are 45 Indian doctors stationed from the Atlantic to the Pacific and serving as far north as Baffinland, all like Dr. Corrigan, fighting ignorance and malnutrition and disease, often against almost insuperable difficulties in Canada's trackless back country. And gradually they are winning. A few years ago, North American Indians seemed in danger of extinction. Now they are increasing. With new hospitals, new outposts staffed with nurses, and new radio communications, the new generation of Canada's first citizens should have a better future than their forefathers ever dreamed of.